Hello and welcome to The Hub, I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Almost three decades ago, Eric Soheim went on a top secret mission to Sri Lanka. The objective? To broker peace between the Sri Lankan government and the rebels, who are fighting for an independent state. Now the former Norwegian diplomat is back in Asia again, and Sri Lanka is restive once more. What set up the new crisis? Things have been moving fast in Sri Lanka. Embattled President Godabaya Rajapaksa fled the country on July 13th after protesters stormed his official residence. After he sent his resignation from abroad, Prime Minister Ranu Wickremesinghe was elected the new president. The economy of the country today is in a very difficult place. Young men and women are asking for change in the system. To go forward, we need to come up with a new program. Can the new president restore stability? The 73-year-old is a six-time former prime minister. Over a long political career, he's gained a reputation for being economically capable, steering Sri Lanka out of a recession in 2001. Now, my guest today is none other than Eric Soheim, former UN Undersecretary General and Chief of UN Environment, as well as Norway's former Minister of International Development and Environment. Currently, he is president of the Grain Belt and Road Institute, a nonprofit in Beijing. Mr. Soheim, you're a man who wears many hats beside the environment and climate. You have also successfully worked in the area very far removed from climate, that is, war and peace. You broker the ceasefire in 2002, I believe. Uh, then it was, uh, you know, broken, of course, and finally the army extinguished the rebellion in 2009. Again, we're talking about uh, Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka started a new chapter. Uh, so what was your reaction when you heard that a fresh crisis uh, has been erupted in Sri Lanka, a, a country that you have visited and that's very dear to your heart, I suppose? I felt, of course, very, very sad because there is so much suffering for the people of Sri Lanka, the rickshaw drivers who are lining up for days just to get a little petrol to run the rickshaw for, for a day, uh, or all the people in the tourist industry being led off, or people struggling to, just to get the, the ba basic goods in, in, in the shops and to get the life forward. So this is an enormous crisis for the people of Sri Lanka. And of course it comes, as you say, after many, many years of, of civil war. I believe that there were, were lost opportunities during that war. In 2002, we had the opportunity to make a federal state in Sri Lanka, which would have been acceptable to all communities. Fortunately, that opportunity was lost. After the huge military victory of the government of Sri Lanka in 2009, again, there was another lost opportunity that didn't reach out to the Tamils to create a land acceptable to both Sinhalese uh, and Tamils. They were very effective in war, but it was not magnanimous. Uh, in, in peace. Now there is a, it's a revolution in Sri Lanka, there is a new opportunity, and let's hope that this deep, deep crisis in Sri Lanka can be turned into something positive uh, for the future. But this strikes many as an endless cycle, isn't it? When the Tamil Tigers were defeated, the president was uh, Mahinda Rajapaska, and this time around, deposed president is his brother. What went wrong? I mean, why did the brothers somehow win the civil war and yet lose the socioeconomic battle, if you will? I think there are three main reasons for this crisis. I mean, you're absolutely right. The Rajapaksa brothers uh, were enormously popular among the Sinhalese part of the population after winning the war, establishing peace uh, in Sri Lanka. And as late as in 2019, and Gotabaya Rajapaksa was elected president with an overwhelming majority, a huge victory uh, in Sri Lanka. Three things went wrong. Uh, number one, uh, they created a family dynasty where four brothers dominated everything in Sri Lanka. They did not have any kind of proper economic policies. They spent huge uh, public resources while at the same time lowering uh, taxes, which of course is a recipe for disaster. Secondly, uh, um, Sri Lanka was very unlucky. Uh, the COVID crisis hit Sri Lanka harder than nearly any other place because of the tourist dominated economy, because tourists didn't come during COVID and it was a huge catastrophe for, for national budget added 
Uh, they have many migrants to the Middle East, which of course also sent less money back home through, through COVID. And thirdly, the fact that the Tamil crisis in Sri Lanka is not resolved made the, the defense budget in Sri Lanka enormous and a very, very oversized military for such a small developing country because dragged resources which should more helpfully been used in education or health or road construction. Now, what do you think will happen to Sri Lanka? Can the president somehow address the root causes uh, facing the Sri Lankan society? I mean, to address it fast enough, really, when it comes to fuel crisis, uh, food scarcity, inequality, and like you rightly mentioned, um, high prices and COVID, among other things. Yeah, I mean, in the midst of the revolution, <laughs> it's very, very hard to predict the, the, the future, but let me give it a try. Sometimes into the future, maybe later this year or next year, there will be elections of a new president or a new prime minister. And the, the best possible future for Sri Lanka is reaching out to the leader of the Tamils, Mr. Sumantaram, and they can form some kind of joint uh, government in Sri Lanka for the first time in modern times, bridging the gap between the Sinhalese, the Muslims and the Tamils into one uh, broad government for Sri Lanka. There will be hardships for sure. There is no easy way out of the crisis. Sri Lankans need to work hard and they need to pay taxes. Uh, there is no shortcuts. Uh, but if they get a broad government and, and work hard and set the right policies, I'm confident that the future will be much brighter in a few years' time. You know, the Sri Lankan crisis seems an opportunity also for China critics to play the blame game again on China. Uh, there are allegations that Sri Lanka's debts to China caused the crisis this time around. But according to Sri Lanka's official data, uh, China accounts for only 10 percent of Sri Lanka's 35 billion U.S. dollar debt, uh, the same as Japan, by the way, and market borrowings take up the lion's share, about 47 uh, percent, not China. Um, how did this perception war, if you will, against China arise? I mean, how do you feel about this uh, accusation or you know, gap of perception against China? Very frankly, this is complete, complete nonsense. Uh, China cannot be blamed for the crisis in Sri Lanka, nor, by the way, Japan or the West or India or anyone else. This is a crisis which originated from unluck from the COVID crisis and from poor management by the government of Sri Lanka itself. Chinese uh, or, the, or Sri Lankan debt to China is 10 percent of the overall debt. So obviously China is not to be blamed. This is pure and simple anti-Chinese propaganda from some sources, and it needs to be refuted. The future of Sri Lanka is, of course, very much with India, because India is the big neighbor, and in India is the kind of the family. It's the same language, the same food, the same, uh, uh, same religions. Uh, Sri Lankans look exactly like Indians. But adding to this close relationship to India, Sri Lanka will benefit tremendously from Chinese investments in roads or ports or railroads or in a different way, ways, but of course also from investments from Japan or from, from the West. This has been a summer of discontent. Besides military and political crises, the world seems to be rushing towards a climate apocalypse. The mercury is rising in Europe, North Africa, the Middle East and Asia. In Spain, over 360 have died due to heat-related causes in one week in July. Britain's Luton Airport in London suspended flights after the tarmac on the runway melted. In Indian capital New Delhi, the temperature reached 49 degrees Celsius. In China, the meteorological authorities have issued a high temperature warning till mid-August. Um, I'm from Texas, so I'm used to the heat, but uh, this is unreal. Just walking in the shade a lot, trying not to get in the sun. I uh, got this bottle of water and it was completely solid ice about five minutes ago. <laughs> um, just trying to stay hydrated and yeah, it's, it's really hot. <laughs> Compared to the 1970s and the 1980s, heat waves were rare, meaning once every 10 years. Now, since the 2010s, we have a recurrence of heat waves and an acceleration that is undeniable. We have almost one to three heat waves per year. Eric Soham calls it a triple crisis of our times. Climate change, environment destruction and pollution. Let's use uh, the wisdom of Confucius. 
We must do it with wisdom, building upon science, doing the right things. We must do it with compassion, bringing everyone on board, also poor people, everyone. And we must do it, we must be brave, courage. Uh, we cannot stop before we have solved this problem. Let's talk about the issue of climate. Two years ago, you said at the World Economic Forum that you're confident we can heal the earth again. Yet, we're looking at the hottest summer, uh, not just here uh, in parts of Asia, but across the world. How confident are you now that we can still survive this global warming? I'm still very confident that we can survive global warming because we have solved major environment issues in the past. Look, 30 years back, um, the hole in the ozone layer, uh, acid rain were the main environment topics of the day. No one was talking about them any longer because the issues are resolved. Uh, the hole in the ozone layer is coming back. There is no acid rain in most parts of the world. Uh, and look to China. When China uh, established the People's Republic in 1949, life expectancy in China was about 30 years, uh, 30 years, maybe a little bit more than 30 years now. Now it's 78. Soon it will pass 80. Look to this enormous progress of development in China and many other parts of the world. Of course, when we could do these miracles in the past, we can also solve the problem of climate change, even if it's a huge challenge for humanity. But like you said, uh, different countries are at different levels of de development. Uh, you know, some are phasing out uh, fossil fuels, some are barely adopting uh, digital technology, green technologies. Um, how do you see the world in coordinating their actions when it comes to climate change and uh, emission reduction ambitions? Absolutely, we need to work together as one big family because climate change is an enormous challenge to everyone, to the developed and the developing countries alike. But the good news is that now we have all the win-win policies. There's not a choice between development and environment. We can do both at the same time. We can both improve the economy, create jobs, create prosperity, have a much better life, while at the same time being much kinder uh, to, to Mother Earth. One example, of course, is solar energy. When we make the switch from coal to solar, not just it's good for the environment, it's also good for the economy. And you're creating more jobs and you save money because solar energy is cheaper and better uh, than coal. When people prioritize the environment, uh, the perception is they're prioritizing the environment over their jobs, their, their industries. The outcomes can be unexpected. I mean, if you look at the farmers' protests in Denmark, for example, uh, they're protesting against the environment's plans, the government's plans to cut down on nitrogen oxide uh, and other emissions. Uh, this will mean reducing the use of fertilizers, which will hit their livelihoods and their bottom line. Uh, how would you balance people's livelihood with environmental priorities? A green movement needs to be a people's movement. It needs to put people first and people's interest first. But of course, we have a new development model now. The old model, the 20th century, was first you prioritize economic development, create jobs and create an enormous pollution on the way. But now in the 21st century, there's no such choice to be made between development and environment because we can do both at the same time, move very, very fast to protect the planet, while at the same time create jobs and prosperity. And China, of course, is a key example of, of that. In the last 10 years, China has done fantastically much better on the environment, reduced pollution in all the big cities, cleaned up many of the rivers, uh, planting trees at a, at a large scale. All this is good for the Chinese economy, while at the same time, it's good for the planet. China now produces 80% of all the solar panels in the world. It's the dominant wind power uh, um, na nation, it produced 80% of all hydropower last year, and China has 70% of all the battery, electric battery production, production in, the, in the world. All this is good for the Chinese economy, but at the same time, fantastic news for humanity. You talk about China's dual carbon goals, that is carbon peaking and net zero. Uh, how do you see that coming? And perhaps more importantly, what would you see as the biggest challenges along the way? The biggest challenge is the tra change in mindset from seeing environment as a cost and as a problem 
into seeing it as an enormous opportunity for economic development, job creation and prosperity. And China is doing this, and but it's not just China. India, the, the other big developing countries, is doing exactly the same. Prime Minister Modi of India has put up a green hydrogen mission for, uh, for India. He is uh, moving into solar energy very, very fast. India is the first all solar rail uh, station or first all solar airport in the world. And again, all these are creating jobs for Indians, while at the same time, uh, it's very good news uh, for, for the planet. And very soon, India will be the second biggest solar nation in the world, next to China. Environmental protection has become part of China's five-year plans since 1975. In 2021, China hosted COP15, the UN Biodiversity Summit in Kunming, where President Xi Jinping pledged $230 million to establish a global biodiversity fund. The first five national parks have been established to optimize nature reserves. Wild tigers, decimated in Southeast Asia and Southern China, have a new lease of life in Northeastern China, with their population climbing to 55. Giant pandas, one of the world's most loved animals, are no longer an endangered species. Their number is now over 1,800 from about 1,000 in 1988. We can talk about the environment. There are so many components of it. For example, biodiversity, uh, that is a, a thing that is very much associated with our lives. Um, China is very committed to this issue. Last year, there was a major declaration on biodiversity in southern China. Um, how would you rate the effort of the biodiversity here in China? I think uh, if you look 10 or 20 years back, there was very limited consciousness on the environment in China because China prioritized economic growth for very understandable reasons, bringing everyone out of extreme poverty. But now President Xi has set a target uh, of another type of growth, more people-centered uh, and more responsible growth. And China is also moving into environment protection at a very large scale. Look to the fishing bands of the Yangtze or the Upper Yellow River. These are huge undertakings in the short uh, run, painful for, for some of the people, fishermen living there, but fantastic news for the long-term environment. And when the ecosystems are restored, fish will come back in abundance. China is leading in high-tech protection of nature, like the panda protection in Sichuan, uh, the greening of the desert of Inner Mongolia is the best practice uh, in the world, and some of the green cities, particularly in southern China, like Suzhou or Hangzhou or Guangzhou or, or Shenzhen, are now among the greenest cities in the entire world. So the rest of the world can learn a lot from China uh, in how to protect protect nature. In Shenzhen, there is a huge uh, wetlands right in the city center of, of this me me mega city. Again, putting um, the protection of nature first, but for the benefit of the people. Exactly. Uh, I want to talk about your career. There's something very intriguing about your um, continental shift, if you will, in your career. Uh, in 2019, you joined the Green Party of Norway and um, saying that uh, the time has come to build a broad Green People's Party that puts the environment first. Um, why this change? Because the big challenge of the 21st century is the triple environment crisis. Climate change is real. We have many polluted cities in, in many parts of the world. And of course, we are destroying nature, wiping out uh, animals uh, at a very high rate. This needs to stop. But we have all the policies, all the technologies, and all the finances needed to make that shift. We just need to mobilize a broad global people's movement for the environment. Uh, and it, it needs to put people first, because people are causing the environment problems, but also people are set to benefit uh, from the solution to the environment problems. You know, when I talk about your, uh, the continental shift in your career, I also mean it uh, literally. From Norway, now you're working very closely with China. Um, what has brought you back to this part of the world? Mainly because I believe that the 21st century is the Asian century. <laughs> the 19th century may have been the European century and the 20th the American. In the 21st century, we'll go back to the roots of history 
with China, India, where the dominant economies in the world. That will happen very soon. Indonesia, by the way, will be the fourth biggest economy in the world by, uh, by 2050. So we see a huge shift to Asia. And we also see now Asia, governments like the Chinese and the Indian, but also civil society groups and the people moving to the forefront of the leadership in this green shift. No one should blame Asia for the environment crisis. U.S. emissions per capita are 25 times Indians up to this point, eight times Chinese up to, in, uh, up to this point. So neither India nor China should be blamed for the climate crisis, but they can take the lead uh, in the shift. And I want to make my very, very small uh, contribution to help uh, making this shift happening. You know, you've been talking about a great green uh, Belt and Road project. How do you see that coming? There are many great, uh, prog pr great Belt and Road projects happening. Look to rail construction as an example. Uh, the Trans-Malaysia Railroad is now uh, moving fast forward. Last year, the uh, Vientiane Laos uh, to, um, to uh, Yunnan Railroad was finished. In Africa, I have myself many times taken the Nairobi Mombasa Railroad. There is the Ethiopia Djibouti Railroad. <laughs> there is the railroad in Indonesia from Bandung. Uh, to, to Jakarta, or uh, there, is, there is the Hanoi uh, metro mm. system. All these are constructed by China. So it's great for those nations, making mobility better, improving the economies of Laos or Malaysia or Indonesia. But of course, it's also fantastic news for the planet because moving from road to rail or to sea transport is much better for the environment. I think you're in a unique position to answer this question given your credentials in uh, the environment, uh, politics, uh, diplomacy. Sir, how would you envision a post-COVID world? What will it look like? The most important is to remember this old Indian saying, the whole world is one family. If we can bridge the gaps in the world, particularly make China and the United States the two dominant powers of the 21st century, if we can work hand in hand, there's no limit to what we can achieve. We can resolve the economic crisis and bring every pe person in the world up into prosperity. We can solve the environment crisis. And working together, it will also be much easier to solve the mil military crisis like in Ukraine or in Ethiopia or in Myanmar or in Yemen. Uh, only if we work together, we will be able to solve the big issues for humanity in the 21st century. And that's why I call for everyone in China to stop all sorts of anti-American sentiments. And of course, I call very, very strongly on the United mm -hmm. States to work closely with China and stop the China bashing, which we so often see from, from Washington. Secretary Eric Soheim, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you so much. Xie xie. Xie xie, thank you. And that's all we have for this edition of The Hub. Thanks for joining us. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.